Hello, everyone. Welcome. It's so nice to have you all here for this amazing evening with Rebecca Solnit to discuss Not Too Late. Can we give it up one more time for these amazing folks? Well, good evening, everyone. We're so thrilled to be here this evening to discuss climate action and hope, which are several themes in the book, Not Too Late, Changing the Climate Story from Despair to Possibility. As demonstrated by the turnout to tonight's event, it's clear that people are ready to take climate action, um, and we look forward to discussing what that could look like and how to bring others into the movement. Um, as Zia mentioned, my name's Ellen McClure, and I'm the climate literacy teacher on special assignment for Berkeley Unified School District. Uh, BUSD's climate literacy program began in 2021 after the school board passed the student-written climate literacy resolution entitled An Educational Response to the Climate Emergency. One of four similar school district resolutions in the state of California, it commits to graduating students who are well-versed in climate change science, issues, solutions, and environmental and climate justice as a civil rights issue. The resolution states that now is a time to educate students for the world they'll be entering after high school. After the past, over the past two years, our climate literacy working group has addressed the goals of the resolution through creative and persistent efforts. We are creating spaces for students to explore climate change and what solutions look like. Teachers are developing lessons and hands-on projects that are age appropriate, informative, and uplifting. Students are speaking before the school board and advocating for sustainable practices. Our schools are celebrating this work through campus activities, climate literacy showcases, and the upcoming district climate fair, which is happening this Saturday at Longfellow Middle School. So we invite you all to come. Um, at the end of our first full year of our climate literacy working group, we gathered together to reflect on the year and share highlights from student and teacher accomplishments. So it was fitting that our send-off to the summer that year was a copy of Not Too Late for all of our teachers. We ended our year with a reading from the book and became, began our first meeting of this school year with another excerpt. This week, many ninth grade English classes at BHS read and discussed several excerpts from the book as well. So in this way, Not Too Late has been an inspiring guide for our climate literacy work in BUSD. And given our connection to the book, it's such a privilege to be able to be in conversation today with Rebecca Solnit and three incredible Berkeley High School students to discuss the themes of the book. Yeah. So I'd like to begin by introducing our students. Um, and it's such an honor to be able to introduce each of these inspiring activists that you're going to be hearing from this evening. Taylor Raynaud is a Berkeley High School freshman. She is, <laughs> she's a journalist with the Berkeley High School Jacket and a producer of the Jacket podcast. In addition to her work at the Jacket, she's involved in youth and government through the Berkeley YMCA. In her free time, Taylor enjoys dancing and loves cooking and baking. Azu Sena Uribe is a Berkeley High School junior. Azu is passionate. Azu is passionate about social and environmental justice for all and has organized with BHS Sunrise. She's been a member of Jewish Youth for Community Action and Jews Against Marginalization for over two years. They work with the nonprofit Olamim, an organization for Latinx and Jewish families. They also enjoy dancing at De Destiny Arts Center and Berkeley High. Amelia, Amelia Monaco Olson is a senior at Berkeley High. She is the vice president of the BHS Sunrise Chapter and has been actively involved in the campaign for a Green New Deal for Schools resolution. Amelia is also one of the student leaders of the Amnesty International chapter at BHS and is a student leader with the group Students Demand Action, a gun violence prevention group. And now I'd like to introduce our final guest for this evening's conversation. Rebecca Solnit is a writer, historian, and activist, and author of 25 books on feminism, 
environmental and urban history, popular power, social change and insurrection, wandering and walking, hope and catastrophe. She co-edited the 2023 anthology, Not Too Late, Changing the Climate Story from Despair to Possibility. Her other books include Orwell's Roses, Hope in the Dark, Men Explain Things to Me, and A Paradise Built in Hell, The Extraordinary Communities That Arise in Disaster. And many of these titles will be for sale after the talk. Uh, a product of the California public education system from kindergarten to graduate school. She writes regularly for The Guardian, serves on the board of the climate group Oil Change International, and recently launched the climate project Not Too Late. Um, as an avid reader of her work for many years, I'm personally thrilled and hope you all will join me in welcoming Rebecca Solnit. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, we, uh, our first question is um, to ask, what was the inspiration behind uh, Not Too Late? What made you write this book? What was the goal? And what was the process like uh, bringing it all together? My friend Thelma Young Lutuna Tabua, who's a Fiji-based climate organizer, and I met um, through some pandemic mutual aid organizing in 2020 and started a conversation because we felt like nobody was really addressing a lot of the grief, anxiety, and despair in a what felt like a constructive, direct way. And we also felt like a lot of that was due to people not having um, good facts, good frameworks, a good sense of what the climate movement has done, can do, a sense that they have some power. And so we started, we actually thought we were going to do a podcast until we realized that um, that requires a lot of skill and time we didn't exactly have, and money. And, um, and um, so we started, we did a website that's not too late climate.com and um, started posting on social media and things like that. And it was really funny. I told a bunch of friends I'd stop writing books because I wanted to be a better climate activist. Um, and, you know, had this new project and I told them about it and they just all looked at me and were like, Rebecca. That needs to be a book. <laughs> and, and I was like, you know, and I was like, oh! <laughs> because in a way, I think I was having a very Protestant moment that like giving up the one thing I'm moderately good at and know how to do made me a more noble person, which, you know, but, um, you know, but also I have a fabulous publishers at Haymarket, which publish this. So Thelma's on Fiji time. I call her the girl from tomorrow because they're, um, it's, I always think of it as five hours later, but they're 19 hours ahead of us. So like she got on board and I had an agreement to publish by 10 a.m. the next morning and told all my, my, it was all Berkeley people I was having dinner with. Berkeley made me do it. <laughs> and, uh. But we really felt that there's a lot of books on climate, there's a lot of great websites, podcasts, blogs, wonderful scientists and organizers on social media, meetings, et cetera, but there wasn't a really good introduction to climate that was an, an encouraging and broad one that covered science, activism, our kind of emotional and spiritual inner life, some history, and uh, looked at some of the geography of it, the global south and the global north, et cetera. And so we wanted to make that book, and we kind of feel like we did. It was really fun, actually. We came up with our dream team. Like, what first, what do we want to cover? And then who do we want to invite? Like, who's going to be our person to talk about this, about this, about this? And everyone we asked said yes one way or another. Some of these articles had been previously published but were updated. Some people didn't have, like Adrian Reed Brown and um, Antonia Juhas didn't have time to write, but they did interviews with us. But we got them all in, so it was really great. So Rebecca, can you read us a passage or um, from your book that stands out to you? I know you brought a little... Um, yeah. I, the book's sort of meant to be read more at leisure. It's every sec, every chapter is concise. I don't think any of them's over two thousand words, except for Hannah's, which I cut down from 
7,000 words with another 4,000 of footnotes. Um, <laughs> it was an academic article on climate colonialism, but so vital to have in the book. And she's become a friend. But so for you all, um, I also have lots of notes in case I need to throw out climate facts, because one always should. And um, But I felt like I wanted to just, I talk a lot about good facts and good frameworks, and I wanted to just give um, a really quick overview of those. I sort of thought this would look like a Berkeley High audience. I noticed a lot of silver hair that is definitely not people who definitely graduated from high school a little while ago. <laughs> How many of you are high school or younger? <laughs> Yay. Hello, future. Hello, people who might be hanging out in 2100. Um, so, I want us. I want us. I want to see us do what the climate emergency requires of us for the sake of all life on Earth, for wild things, for other species, for the poor, the indigenous, the people in the global South, the young who will live to see the 22nd century, the people who will be born on this beautiful planet in a hundred and a thousand years. I'm also a nice lady who doesn't want people to feel bad when that feeling is just misery and not energy for action. And I think that for both of these agendas, good facts and good frameworks matter. They can be hard to come by if you get your climate information and broader perspectives from the mainstream media or from the shit people say on the internet. I mean, there's some completely amazing people, brilliant climate scientists and organizers saying great stuff on social media, but there's also a lot of disinformation and misinformation that really makes people feel confused or defeated, um, and often that the future has already been decided, which is why this is called Not Too Late. We're deciding it now. So, And there's not much to teach you how to sift that out. So a lot of my climate work boils down to facts and frameworks, at least when it's about speaking roles and not just protests and supporting organizations and donating money and all that other stuff I try to do. So I made a short list of annotated facts. I think there's five. First of all, number one, it's not too late. Of course, there has already been terrible damage, and there's some ongoing damage we can't stop. But there is a lot we can stop. It's unlikely, but not actually impossible, for us to actually go carbon negative, draw down some of the carbon dioxide emitted over the past 150 years, especially the past 30, and actually stabilize the climate and cool down the planet. We actually know how to do that, and scientists weren't talking about that until recently, but as humanity, our hand is on the thermostat. We've been turning it up for 150 years. We can stop that, or we and, but we also can turn it down. And um, even if we can't do that, we can do a lot, and everything we do matters. Every tenth of a degree of warming we prevent matters. Every forest we can protect matters. Every energy transition in any every locality matters. The future is something we're making in the present. And in a big way, we're deciding that future right now. Twelve, uh, six years ago, climate scientists told us we have 12 years to get it right. A lot of good stuff has happened, but not nearly enough in the first half of those 12 years. We've got six left to organize, amplify, and push on. And change is not always um, predictable. It can go slow, 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 fast. It can be you build, 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 nothing happens, and then everything happens. So um, there will always be something worth doing, and never more so for the fate of the Earth than in these next six years. So two. Uh, one of the great pieces of misinformation is that most people think nobody cares about the climate or most people don't care about the climate. Um, that was actually true 10 or 15 years ago. A lot of ideas that are, are just wrong because they're out of date. And um, most people care a lot about the climate. They're, they may not be experts, but they're aware, very aware of climate change and they want to see action. They want to see the world change in response. They want to see the government spend money. They want to see things change. And that, I think, does a lot to help people feel less lonely. So I think a lot of people realize climate change is terrible and um, but feel like no one cares because they don't see that a lot of people do. Greta Thunberg actually said, I know so many people feel hopeless and they ask me, what should I do? And I say, act, do something. 
because that is the best medicine against sadness and depression. And then Bill McKibben, who founded 350.org, wrote the first popular book on climate change in 1989 and started Third Act um, for climate people over 60. I've seen him many times be asked, what's the best thing I can do as an individual? And he always says, stop being an individual. Unless, unless you're a senator or tremendously wealthy or something like that, you have power, but as part of a group, not as an individual. Three, the problem is not all of us. It's the fossil fuel industry and other major sources of greenhouse gases and their political activity and the banks, shareholders, and politicians who protect and benefit from the destruction. And it's also not everybody because the richest 1% of humanity has a bigger climate impact than the poorest 66% of humanity. So the farmer in Bangladesh is not equivalent to the billionaire in Manhattan or Silicon Valley. And, um, you know, it's not all of us. And that's also why we don't need people to stay home and have individual, you know, personal virtue, AKA have a climate footprint the size of a deer mouse. Um, you know, and but the fossil fuel industries really pushed climate footprints because they want us all to stay home and think that we're the problem and, and try and perfect ourselves rather than go after them. So, but we need to go out there collectively and go after their enormous climate footprints, stop extraction, speed the transition to clean energy, electrify everything, design a world that works better for the climate, which will also work better for social justice and for our connections to each other in nature. Four, we have the solutions. This is another outdated thing. I didn't fully understand until not that long ago that in the year 2000, wind and sun were really primitive, expensive, and utterly inadequate technologies to solve our problems. We have lived through the most astonishing energy revolution, in many ways bigger than the industrial revolution. We can make more power than we could ever possibly use from wind and sun, and it keeps getting cheaper and more efficient, and problems of materials, battery storage, transmission, et cetera, keep, are getting solved. People all over the world are working on it. And um, so we actually, we have the solutions, we know what to do, we just have to overcome the obstacles to doing them. At um, five, um, we're, there's always this grumbling like, oh, it's very expensive to do what, you know, to do what we need to do. But in fact, it's so much cheaper than have the world fall apart. Um, you know, it's really like, um, you know, it's like fixing your car versus having your car blow up. Not that cars are a very appropriate example here. And um, like, oh my God, it will cost another, you know, it will cost $200 for a muffler or for this new part and versus it'll cost $10,000 if the engine blows or so. There's been a lot of grumbling that building all these new clean power sources and transmission lines and stuff costs money, but doing nothing is so much more expensive and that cost comes as damage, damage to cities, towns, farms, crops, transportation, nature itself, to um, individuals, to people in the Arctic, or, uh, to indigenous people, to people in the global south, to people particularly in Africa, the tropics, and the Arctic. And I feel like we in the global north don't have the right to do nothing. When we give up, when we get passive, when we quit, we're, we're quitting we're quitting our solidarity with them. We're quitting our responsibility as people who have power and climate impact, but also economic and political impact. So a new article in the scientific ma magazine Nature estimates that the damage caused by doing nothing by 2050 will cost six times more the cost of keeping global warming to two degrees centigrade. What expensive often really means is that it'll cost the fossil fuel industry and related industries a lot because they'll, they'll cease to exist in a lot of senses. People who continue to invest in them will lose money. But for the rest of us, it means a better world. And the rest of us not, not only means humans, it means um, the big we of all species, plants, animals, et cetera, and, and it, all of us also for now, the end of the century, the end of the millennium, um, and we're making decisions for the next 10,000 years. So six, a lot of people feel like we haven't done anything. The climate movement has not done nearly enough or we would be just like sitting and resting on our wonderful victories. 
But we have done a hell of a lot. This would be a radically different world without the climate movement. And we see that every day. Today, the Bureau of Land Management, sec second story on the front page of the Washington Post, completely changed your priorities for 10% of all the land in the United States. From now on, the decisions will not prioritize extraction and exploitation, which is always profit for a minority. It will um, prioritize conservation, protection, and the well-being of the whole. That is a revolution that was almost unimaginable. And it, like so many things, it's easy to feel like the government gave it to us, but a government that had a completely different worldview because the climate movement changed our worldview, changed our priorities because, you know, direct action and pressure and the transformation of ideas have real consequences and that turn what begins as a beautiful idea or a radical idea ends up as something tangible, practical. The oil that won't be extracted, the coal that won't be mined, the forest that won't be cut down. And so that you know, so the climate movement has done a hell of a lot. There's a long list of climate victories I compiled in the Not Too Late anthology. We need to do a hell of a lot more. We need to get more powerful than the fossil fuel industry. We need to do uh, expand what we're doing and accelerate it. But we have done a lot, and that's important to remember. So that's some of the facts as I see them, some of the big ones. But I also think in this country, we're often given really disempowering frameworks by frameworks, I mean the broad ideas we filter specific information through. I think we get those bad frameworks about really two really important things for climate and for activism generally, or three. These things are the nature of power, the nature of change, and what was the third one I added after I wrote that sentence? At, um, you know, the all or nothing perfectionism. So we're constantly told that power resides in a few exceptional people. Just like in superhero movies, most of us are fucking losers. And then there's somebody very muscly who's good at violence who's going to save us all. Um, which is a really annoying misrepresentation of how we, you know, how we save ourselves, how we take care of ourselves, how we change the world. So, um, you know, like the extremely wealthy, the extremely famous, um, powerful, you know, high profile or high power politicians like senators, presidents, governors do hold a lot of power. But a lot of us don't have power, much power. We have some power as individuals in our consumption, in our participation as citizens, in voting and writing letters to editor, sitting in city council meetings, like that fucking amazing one Berkeley had that banned gas hookups in 2019. I'll say I have a, a little more to say about. And, um, but we have power together. And one of the things I always say is that sometimes your enemies see you most accurately. The fossil fuel industry is terrified of the climate movement. The Republicans who protect it are terrified of the climate movement. They know we're powerful. They know we can win even when we don't remember it. So I think that's really an important part of it. Um, we have power. So, and like, we, like the story I just told about protecting 10% of all the land in this country, you can, the short-term memory says, oh, nice, nice, powerful people gave us this nice thing. The long-term story says this happened because of organizing activism, grassroots people we should feel grateful to even if we never know their names. Just like President Biden canceled student debt last week, um, a bunch more student debt. And again, you can say, oh, the nice man gave us something. But what really happened is that the out of Occupy Wall Street came a very powerful debt abolition movement that really transformed the whole conversation about debt, rendered it, made its exploitation and corruptness visible, the way it destroyed lives, completely changed the rules. And if there had been no movement, there would have been no de debt cancellation. So at the end, you see the very visible people, but that you got to see the whole story. So that's power, but the other, and I will wrap this up shortly. <laughs> but, um, the other thing I would say is change, because I also feel like people often tell what I call instant results guaranteed or your money back stories about change. They treat change like ordering a pizza. We ordered a pizza. If it doesn't arrive right on way, we don't get anything. But, you know, changing the world is really different than ordering pizza. You know, I really see people have, pro it's like if we protest on Tuesday and the government doesn't say, you're right and we're wrong and we're going to give you everything you asked for, then the protest failed. But 
A lot of change is indirect. A lot of it takes a long time. It took 11 times to stop the KXL pipeline that would bring dirty crude from Alberta to southern the southern U.S. for export. Um, it took, you know, it took 80 years for women to get the vote. It took decades to abolish slavery, more decades for civil, you know, for civil rights. Marriage equality began with queer rights movements in the 50s and 60s and 70s. At, um, so people often fail to see how change works. And if you don't see that, and I think that's so central to hope, is to learn from the past, how did, how did we get this really good thing? Everything good we have in our lives now, almost, you know, whether it's this protected landscape or this right came because people fought for it in the past. Remembering that, I think, gives us hope and also gives us templates of how change happens and that we often don't have. I the Berkeley City Council gas ban in 2019. I know that I always knew when I talked about lots of people would be, oh, Berkeley, whatever. You're probably used to that. You know, and what's one little city? When, or, are you a city or a town? Ooh. ooh. <laughs> Do you all have very strong opinions about that? <laughs> I mean, I'm from San Francisco, and we're very clear what we are um, before we became a suburb of Silicon Valley, but um, never mind. But, um, you know, you can say, oh, that's just one small city. And, um, but it became a template for 50 other California municipalities and then for New York City. And some of those municipalities were LA, the second biggest city in the country, for the whole state of Washington, for other parts of the world to say, oh yeah, banning gas hookups is a really important part of the transition. And Berkeley's, you know, and, Ber and also the short, the short narrow stories, and then, then your ban was overturned, but I'm hoping there will be another one soon. I don't know if it's in the works. I bet some of you do. But even though, and so you can say in a way, Berkeley's gas ban failed, but it failed to ban gas hookups in Berkeley for now, but it succeeded in a whole different way. You have to recognize those indirect consequences. The Standing Rock protest didn't stop the Dakota Access Pipeline. They might still, it's not done. They galvanized extraordinary organizing and hope and solidarity among Native American people and non-Native supporters. Um, my favorite story is that a college graduate and her friends from New York got in a station wagon and came out. And 2016, you would have never heard of this young woman who came out with her friends, a young Latina. But she was so moved by what she saw at Standing Rock. She did this completely wild thing that I'm sure 99.9% .9 of people would tell her would never work. She decided to run for Congress against the third most powerful Democrat in the House. All of you have heard of her. Her name is AOC. Um, the Dakota Access pipe, uh, Pipeline b battle at, and the movement at Standing Rock inspired her. She introduced the Green New Deal that the Sunrise Movement helped bring into, the, uh, into Congress. That didn't pass either, but it became a template for Biden's climate platform, which became Build Back Better, which didn't pass, but became the Inflation Reduction Act, which not only passed, but became an incentive for a lot of other countries to step up their climate action for a lot of, you know, the impact of that is so huge, it's hard to measure. So, and then the last thing I just want to say is the, another framework I see all the time in act of, climate activism is the all or nothing. If we can't save everything, we can't do anything. Um, if anything that's not perfect is terrible. Anything, if we don't win everything, we lose everything. And, um, and we can't save everything because then we would have had to, had to start, you know, we were losing things 100 years ago. Species were going extinct. We were losing things 50 years ago. We were putting more carbon into the atmosphere. I'm really old. I was born at 311 parts per million of carbon dioxide. We're at like 420 something now. And, um, but we can, uh, just because you can't save anything doesn't mean, can't save everything doesn't mean you can't save anything. We can do so much right now, and the difference between the best and the worst case scenarios um, are so extraordinary and important for so many beings, and we we just got to do it. So you know, so those are the three frameworks: um, the nature of power, the nature of change, um, getting past kind of binary all or nothing stories, and um, so you know, I just wanted to kind of lay out those things as like my kind of my my sketchbook for looking at how we tell climate stories.
Thank you so much. That was so moving. Um, so kind of to go off of what you just said, um, you've written so many different books on so many numerous topics. Um, why climate change and why now? I mean, there was a long period, and I read Bill McKibben's piece in The New Yorker that turned into the first popular climate book, and I was already working with Rainforest Action Network. I think one of your questions was, when did you start? I remember talking to, like, being a really shy 20-something-year-old standing on a corner in San Francisco's financial district saying the Amazon rainforest is the lungs of the earth and having some mansplainer correct me. And now I think about it, it's like, yeah, because forests are crucial to the climate, and so maybe I can count 1988 as being a climate activist. But I used to be climate is really important, and so is this other thing I worked on. I worked on indigenous rights. I worked on anti-nuclear stuff. I worked on forest protection and a lot of other environmental stuff. I did a ton of feminism because men should stop killing, beating, and raping women. Um, everybody, anybody, you know, everybody should stop doing that to anybody. Not that everybody's doing it, but um, this could get very confusing. And, um, and then it just, you know, it became clearer and clearer to me that the climate was more important than everything else. And there's an old Earth First bumper sticker, there are no jobs on a dead planet, that everything else we care about human health, human rights, um, you know, at, at um, the, all, every, that if you don't have the basic physical well-being, you know, if you die of air pollution when you're 23, you don't have any rights when you're 45 because you didn't live that long. And nine, almost nine million people a year die just of particulate matter from fossil fuel emissions. Um, it is huge. And so I just gradually came more and more into it. I was friendly with Bill McKibben, when he founded 350, and I supported them from the inception, however long ago that was, it's like 17 years or something. And I just did more and more. My brother David, whose fantastic art, which you see at almost every Bay Area climate protest. Um, you know, um, was, you know, we had converged in our anti-nuclear work, we converged again in climate work, which is, and he always understood that it's always justice work. And, um, and then like, I got invited, you know, and I was always kind of waiting, like, what is my job? I kept waiting for someone to tell me what my job was. I donated money, I went to protests, I wrote about it in, you know, newspapers and stuff. And then finally it just felt like my work I'd done around hope and stuff was really my work in climate. And I was kind of doing that. And then, you know, I'm now on the advisory board, but probably stepping down from Dianu, a Jewish voice for, cli for climate. Um, third Act, um, Oil Change International, and I have the not too late thing with Thelma. So, I, you know, there's a lot of things I'll never stop being interested in and caring about, but I'm mostly climate these days. And it's been really exciting being around so long. I remember how timid, polite, and in some ways unambitious the climate movement was in the early 2000s. And, you know, we weren't big and strong enough to say, we need to take on the industry directly and just shut it down. We need to stop all new extraction. We need to stop all fossil fuel subsidies. We, you know, and we didn't have the solution. So I, long-term things really give me hope, so. Thank you so much. I wanted to ask you how to bring other people into this movement. The essay by Mary Anais Hegler really resonated with me when she wrote every single person has a powerful role to play as a midwife in this rebirth of a movement. And in your experience, how do you bring other people who might not have as much knowledge about climate change or who haven't been involved in the movement into the work? I know you already answered this some, um, but um, yeah, how do we? Did. Yeah, I think the first thing is be really nice to them. <laughs> you know, and remember that there was a moment where you didn't know everything either, even if you think you now know everything. There's a wonderful thing by Alicia Garza, who found co-founded Black Lives Matter, when she talks about somebody brought me in, somebody, you know, educated me that, you know, and it's, I've seen a lot of activism where people are super snarky to someone who gets, you know, doesn't have the perfect position, doesn't know all the facts. And I joke now that there are organizers, the true goal of an organizer is to bring people together, to motivate them, to draw people in, to be, a, to be welcoming, 
a disorganizer, and God knows there's a lot of them on the left, is somebody who's actually going to make, you know, going to be a perfectionist who's out there to tell everyone else they're not good enough and make them feel nervous, make them shut up, make them stay home, make them feel unwelcome. So, you know, so I think it's inviting people in, um, encouraging them. If you if you want to share information about ideas, values, or facts with them, find a way that doesn't feel patronizing or judgy that they don't know them. Remember that you didn't always. And then I also think so many people want to know, what can I do about climate? I've been at so many protests and meetings and stuff where that's people's real question. You know, not can we save the world, not, you know, not the outcome of this election or, you know, that technical question. They're like, it's like, what can I do? And there weren't really good answers. So we put out Not Too Late the book, and then I realized, like, we gave people the overview and the encouragement we wanted to, or at least we covered it the way we wanted to, but we didn't actually answer that question. So I think they're handing out here this brochure we created, or mostly I created, with art by my brother David, um, called What Can I Do About the Climate Emergency? And I tried to give the most well-organized overview because usually what you get told is like, donate, um, donate, vote, um, come to our protest, sign up for our mailing list. But there's so many different things that matter. And everybody has really different skills. And some people, they're not citizens, they're not able-bodied, they have good reasons to be afraid of the police, et cetera. They don't want to go to protest. They don't want to risk arrest and it's a, you know, or deportation or whatever. But there's things for them to do. You know, if you have a lot of time, um, there's things you can do. If you're young and footloose and you want to join a, you know, a camp out pipeline protest, there's that. But if you're old but really good at writing letters to the editor or participating in city council meetings on Zoom, you know, the scale, um, the scale could be from like putting solar panels on the roof of your high school to international treaties. It's, it, uh, there's often a sense from people that everything happens at the federal level and nothing can happen when we have a Republican. May that not happen again ever for a very long time. Well, I'd go forever. Um, and, um, but California was making really important climate legislation all through the Bush and Trump era. And cities, cities are really important and set their own policies on a lot of important stuff. Protecting agriculture and nature is really important. And so there's really something for everybody that's partly about your skills and partly about your passions. And I also think, so first make people feel welcome and when meet them where they're at. And second of all, help them figure out what their piece of the climate movement is. And there's so many amazing stories about people uh, and who, you know, people who are 11, people who are 90, people who are housebound, people who don't have citizenship, doing absolutely amazing things. There really is a role for everyone. Um, oops, sorry. Uh, that, that actually um, was a question I was gonna ask earlier about like, um, and um, for, for um, to be more specific, for people in the Bay Area, um, like, of course I'm dropping everything. Um, where where can um, where can people start? Like, um, there's so much good work going on in the Bay Area. Yeah, um, and a lot of it I think is just really getting. You know, I wrote this as a kind of thing that would work anywhere in the U.S., so I didn't get super specific. A lot of it is finding the organizations you might want to work with and feel at home with whether it's just a little group of citizens trying to get a city council to pass some legislation, or it's joining, if you're young, the Sunrise Movement might be for you. If you're over 60, you're super welcome to join Third Act, and you just have to look up thirdact.org. There's a bunch of information um, there. There's a bunch of East, East Bay people who belong. 350.org, Greenpeace, the Sierra Club um, are still doing a lot of good stuff. Extinction Rebellion and some other groups are a little more edgy and in the, in your face. There's often specific things happening. It's also really good to be informed. I think, uh, you know, you don't have to know everything. The climate scientists don't know everything. The organizers do. The people who are experts, even the people who are climate scientists have specialization and the people who, who know about oceans don't know everything about atmospheres 
or you know or forests and stuff so but having a good having enough equipment to function with to be like this bill is bullshit this one's really important etc the bay areas in california are kind of interesting in that sometimes we have to push our elected leaders to do more but and you know there are parts of california with republican congress people and um, I think we have a few Republican mayors, but we're mostly a blue state. So it's mostly getting people who agree with you in principle to really act when it comes to legislative stuff. And that's another big decision. Do you want to work kind of within the system or outside the system? Do you want to be in the streets? Do you want to be in the meetings? Do you want to be, you know, um, you, and so, so that, that feels like part of it too. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Um, the another question we had was um, in in one of the in the chapter where it's the the essay um, here's where you come in um, the author uh, one line that particularly uh, stood out to me was um, check your savior complex at the door please um, and I was just wondering like how uh, what your experience is with that like a savior complex and like how that interacts with like um, like a white savior complex and like kind of the masculine identity? How does that um, impact, like, uh, how does that come, what does that look like in the climate space? I, every movement I've been part of has people who think they have all the answers, who often are, often are not actually good at being part of a group. Um, <laughs> Because you, you have to be interested in listening. And sometimes people come up to me after and they have like the amazing solution. All the brilliant engineers in the world never thought of then we should just all do it. You know, it's kind of in there with the contrails and hemp people, but um, sorry. And um, one of the things that, this beautiful thing happened in the anti-nuclear movement in the 1970s and 80s, which accomplished really radical things in terms of actually stopping the nuclear industry. Um, from building more nuclear power, which some people think is a great nuclear, a uh, great um, climate solution, but short version, they're wrong. Um, uh, solar and wind are so much cheaper, better, and don't leave radioactive waste that will be dangerous for 100,000 years and can also be deployed. You can put up solar and wind turbines in weeks. Nuclear power plants take years to build. But the anti-nuclear movement, two things happened, one of which is consensus process came from the Quakers, which meant that you had a process it really helped everybody be hear, heard and make decisions together so you stop the charismatic leader syndrome that created a lot of the craziness of 60s and other kinds of left organizing. Another thing was nonviolent direct action where you, had, you made agreements um, before you acted so you also didn't have some guy deciding he was in charge. But I think a lot of a healthy organization is an organization that rep, rep, respects all its participants, it has a democratic structure, and so it will keep um, white saviors, megalomaniacs, um, people who want to talk for three hours, et cetera, in check. And, um, and I think also having a good critique around race, class, gender, ageism, um, ableism, et cetera, also helps people, um, you know, I. As you all know, I spent, or a lot of you know, I spent a lot of time in dealing with feminism. And what's his name? Chris, Chris what's his name, who played um, Captain America, said at the height of Me Too this completely wonderful thing. Just because, just because you have something to say doesn't mean it's your turn to say it. And that's something I think everyone needs to learn, is that sometimes your valuable role is as a listener. And uh, I know I'm talking a lot and I'm on stage. But. <laughs> I, every time I drive around, I listen to podcasts. You know, I, 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 I'm on the other end too. So, but, um, so yeah, you know, that's, I think that's important that I'm in the same way that democracy, I love that Third Act and other groups now really look at democracy and climate as inseparable. The majority of people in this country and most countries want to see meaningful climate action. The more democracy we have, the more representative our government, the more climate action we get. You know, the same people who want to um, gerrymander, take away voting rights, steal elections, um, serve the fossil fuel industry and stuff. So we want democracy in our movements. We want democracy in general. 
You mentioned a little bit about kind of um, how race plays into the climate movement, but to add on to that, um, climate change affects everyone, but oftentimes minorities and underprivileged communities are the most impacted and the least likely to be heard. Um, we know that leisure time is an important factor to consider when it comes uh, to someone's involvement in the crisis, which is also something that these communities often lack. Um, how can those with privilege help to amplify and make space for the voices those that are most affected? The first rule, ask them, what do you need? What do you want? What can we do for you? What does solidarity with you look like? I think listen to the people who are coming from those places. And a lot of times it's like somebody like me has, has a public voice, time, and resources. And so you have to spend a big part of your life listening to those other people and trying to bring their voices in. As a writer, I quote people, I interview people, and I try to be like a human amplifier for other people's stories. Um, sometimes it's important to visit people. I've talked, you know, go see the impact they're having. And um, my friend Jaime Cortez grew up as a farm worker kid, became a wonderful writer. Some of you probably know his book, Gordo. We did a benefit for the Pajaro co community of farm workers where he lives in the house his parents got, got flooded out by climate change driven Flood. So I think, you know, and he gave me a tour to show me what happened to Pajaro. You know, you don't even you don't even have to go to North Slope, Alaska or Central America to see climate damage. People who've been burned out, people who farm workers working in unbearable heat, people who got flooded are, you know, there was a period a long time ago where I thought climate change wasn't really going to impact us here a lot. And then the fires began. So there's and there's solidarity too with the organizations working with those people, whether it's Amazon Watch, um, you know, Resilience Force, or you know, the fact one of the things that I think is beautiful and would have been unimaginable 40 years ago is that a lot of important climate leadership has been indigenous people, and um, you know, and it felt like people who remembered a deep past of not being alienated and at war with nature were the people who, in, in many cases, could lead us to a future that was not alienated and at war with nature. So some of those people are there. And, you know, it's also if you donate, donate to organizations that support them and amplify them. And, um, you know, and it's funny because also so many times the things we're supposed to do as people who are politically engaged always sound like you have to eat your broccoli. But so many of the things we actually have to do, I think, are like drink. Okay, now a lot of you are underage, but to me, feel like drink your champagne, and um, which I've been old enough to do for 41 years. And um, in that, they're like listening to indigenous climate leaders. You know, it might be your homework, but it might also be beautiful, inspiring, transformative, and uplifting. You know, these things we need to. You know, a democratically organized group is a group. It's a joy to be in. So these things are things we need to do for moral reasons, but you know the the moral thing to do and the fun thing to do are actually often the same thing to do. The urgency described in the book really motivated me, and it made me feel really wide open and hopeful. And I really loved a um, a essay about envisioning envisioning a better future, a love letter from the clean energy future which imagined powering the energy with 100% clean energy by 2030. If we give up, like you were saying, it means on giving up on uh, future generations as well. So how do we create a narrative that helps people understand the urgency of our situation and the impact of our actions now that will how it will play out in the future? I mean, different things work for different people. I and mean, if somebody's 12, they might have not have the same body of knowledge somebody who's 40 has accumulated. Somebody might be, re you know, really motivated by, a, you know, a really moving story of loss or a really moving story of victory. Or they might be a nerd who loves the statistics, like this is how much renewable energy we installed last year. I don't How many of you know that California got 113% of what it needed from renewables um, earlier this month. 
you know, like, I'm not very good at technical things, but, you know, so I try not to talk too much about some of the technical stuff unless I am quoting or something, but some of, some of it is really exciting. I know the energy revolution is happening really fast and um, scaling up fast, getting better, getting cheaper. And um, so it's really different things. So it's really kind of meeting people where they're at. What, what are they excited by? What are they moved by? What, you know, what moves people? I do feel there's been a big belief on the left that fear, fear and anger motivate people. A lot of you know, I actually think hope and love really motivate people. A lot of what gets described as anger, I think, is, is protectiveness. If you don't care about something, you don't want to protect it, so you're not angry if you see it being threatened or hurt. You know, you're angry the forest, the tree was cut down because you love the forest. And so you need to see that the, or even if a lot of what gets called, when well, anger can mean so many different things from, you know, my intense surge of adrenaline when a car almost runs me over when I'm on my bike to, you know, um, ugly hatred to what I think a lot of activists have that I don't think is really anger. It's righteous indignation. Like, it would, like, it's terrible to do that to these people. You know, let's protect, and, but, and that's really love. There's a part of love that can be indignation pr that's really protectiveness. So I think, I, th I feel like that's really important too, is, you know, what are our real motives? What do you love? And almost everybody loves nature. One of the beautiful things I've seen over the last 30 years in particular is I think we've tuned in a lot more to the natural world. And that, I think, motivates a lot of climate action. Think of the place you love, you know, whether it's the ocean, the beach, the forest, the hills, you know, whether you love birds, butterflies, um, the caribou mi migration in northern Alaska, whales, um, you know, I just hung out with a scientist whose specialty is phytoplankton, which I suspect he loves. And, um, you know, so I think that love secretly drives us and getting in touch with it and just reminding each other, because we're in a society that, and also I think social media makes hate is the, hate and anger and indignation are cheap, easy emotions to stir up. But I think it takes real brilliance to remind people that the deepest and most important thing is love and that we don't just love our friends and family and, you know, um, dessert and, and rainbows or whatever. We love being a member of a, we not love being connected to a community. We love feeling that there's a decent future. We love feeling like this baby can live safely to be 80 years old. We, you know, we love justice, we love truth, we love honor, we love dignity, we love people who, you know, are motivated by beautiful principles. So we talk about moral injury when we see ugly and destructive things. We love moral beauty. Um, the wonderful psychologist, Dr. Keltner at UC Berkeley talks about awe. And when he wrote his book on awe, which I highly recommend to everybody, I really thought he was going to talk about the way beautiful and profound things, you know, seeing the Milky Way, seeing the eclipse. I got to be in Texas for that, you know, et cetera. But the first thing he said people were have experiences of awe around is moral beauty. When somebody acts with tremendous integrity, often in a way that risks, takes, is difficult or risky and stuff. And remind being, being reminded of our better selves, I think, is a really important part of all this work is, a lot of popular entertainment, social media, et cetera, has a really ugly, reduced view of who we are as human beings. And a lot of times I see people who think what we need, like what art for the climate movement should be is representations of windmills and, this, and suns, you know, or oil derricks, et cetera. And like, we need those, but we also need things that remind us we are the people who want these bigger, deeper um, things. We are the people who have the power to change the world. So we need, we need these stories of who we really are and what we really want. And that's been a lot of what I've dedicated my life to. And, uh, um, to end off, I wanted to read an essay titled Shared Values Are Our Greatest Hope and Strength by Gloria Walton. She writes that capitalistic values 
have promoted individualistic mindset and made us believe our resources are finite and competitive. But that doesn't have to be our reality. It's our collective responsibility to envision and create a world we want together. We have the power to tap into abundance and collaboration. And community leadership isn't about having it all figured out. It's about the creative spirit and the solutions created together through collaboration. Yeah, you talked a little bit about kind of evoking that feeling of love towards the climate. How do you think that we can inspire others to feel the same? And um, how can we envision and execute this within our communities? I, and the love is usually already there, but you have to remind people and you have to remind them that it's not just that like you like these pretty things. There's a weird language in the sort of settler colonial world of responsibility, which for me always feels like you have to clean your room and pay your taxes. And um, it's very dutiful. Responsibility to me sounds like a very dutiful world. I love that um, Robin Wall Kimmerer, the indigenous botanist biologist, talks about reciprocity. If you begin by seeing, like, you know, evolution gave us, you know, our own species. Um, Every single thing we eat every day, the water we drink, you know, we we can't live for more than a very brief time without, you know, separate from nature. And um, astronauts' bodies start falling apart instantly, almost instantly in space, and they have to do all this crazy stuff to deal with it. And of course, everything they'll survive on, the air, the water, the food comes from Earth. And... Um, so yeah, and I love that quote also because individualism, uh, the isolated individualism, we more and more see as a problem because we are not separate. And um, you know, we are interdependent on each other. I'm not making any of the clothes I wore. I just came on a train I didn't build, powered by energy I didn't generate. You know, somebody else produced this paper um, the wonderful water systems that give us really good water in the Bay Area. You know, nature gave us the water. Um, the ebb mud, I think the ebb mud system brought this to us. <laughs> Although I have a little hetch hetchy in my water bottle back there. And um, so, it, and it's actually, I think that connection is so beautiful. So remembering that, I think is it just, I think a lot of people are ready to do it if they know what to do. And that's, you know, that was what the, what can you do about the climate emergency part. And the, the looking back from the climate future piece you referenced a little while ago, that's by Marianne Hitt. And I know we're winding up. I just want to say who she is. She's a working class woman from West Virginia who became the le one of the leaders on the Sierra Club's Beyond Coal campaign. And um, West Virginia is kind of the, you know, the national center of coal mining. It also happens in Kentucky and Wyoming and stuff, but she led the way to shut down more than 500 coal-powered plants and prevent a bunch more from being built. We get so much less energy from coal than we ever did um, once we started generating electricity. And it's all happened a lot faster than anybody thought it could. And really, people thought coal was going to be here forever. And coal companies have gone bankrupt. It's shut down. It's the, it's transforming fast. And so she's somebody who actually already made the future better. And she's got a daughter who's in middle school and um, she's in a bluegrass band. And um, so, you know, so people are doing stuff everywhere. And it's not always easy to see. The media doesn't do a good job representing it, but um, we're not waiting for it to happen. We're just, you know, it's happening. We're just trying to support what's already happening, and keep dreaming our way forward. So. Thank you.